Who is the angel of the Lord in the Old Testament? As a church, we're looking through the book of Exodus at the moment, so let's take a little time to answer this great question. As Christians, we love the Lord Jesus Christ. We lift him up high in our lives and in our minds and in our souls, and he teaches us all about his Father, God the Father, and he shares his spirit with us. And he says, no one can come to God the Father except through me. So we're always looking to Jesus and he teaches us all about the living God. And the book of Exodus we're studying at the moment, the Lord Jesus is very active in bringing people to meet God the Father, in teaching his church all about God. And as we approach some key passages about this figure in the Old Testament, called the Angel of the Lord, let's do a bit of groundwork. Now, the book of Exodus and many other books in the Old Testament are written by Moses. And in the New Testament, Jesus has a copy of the books of Moses, and he says this in John chapter 5, If you believe Moses, you would believe me, because he wrote about me. So obviously we're to have Jesus in our minds when we approach the book of Exodus. In the New Testament, there's a man called Timothy, and he was raised reading the Old Testament. And in 2 Timothy chapter 3, it says about him, the scriptures that he had made Timothy wise to have faith in Christ Jesus. So the Old Testament that Timothy was reading as a young lad helped him understand lots of things about Jesus. In Acts chapter 26 verses 22 to 23, it says that the New Testament apostles said nothing beyond what the prophets and Moses said would happen in the Old Testament, that the Messiah, Jesus, would suffer and would rise from the dead and would bring the message of light to his own people and all Gentiles, all of us. So Moses, when he's writing his books, is thinking and writing about the Lord Jesus Christ. And in the book of Jude in the New Testament, Jude just comes out and says it, Jesus saved the people out of the land of Egypt and afterwards destroyed those who didn't believe. So as we're asking, who is this Lord God angel character in the books of the Old Testament, those verses really help us begin to think, oh, I think I know who this might be. And there's one other really important thing we have to have in our mind as we approach who is the angel of the Lord and why it matters. And it's the words of Jesus in John chapter 1. No one has ever seen God except the one and only Son. And this is a really important theological point. No one has ever looked at God the Father and lived. So when we read about a seen Lord that people look at and wrestle with and talk to in the Old Testament, often going by this description of the angel, we know that is not God the Father. And when we read about a Lord that fills people and equips people in the Old Testament, we know that's not God the Son. So it's important to remember any passages where people see the Lord, they see God. It cannot be God the Father because that would make Jesus a liar who says no one has ever seen God and lived. When you think of the word angel, don't first think of some created being, something that was made. There are those, but this angel of the Lord, almost in every instance in the Old Testament, is not one of those. There are exceptions in the Old Testament where the other angels who have been created by the Lord are mentioned, but the majority of descriptions is about another angel. And the word angel basically means a messenger, someone who has been sent. And it's very interesting that Jesus in the New Testament often said, I am the one who has been sent to you from the Father. I am the one that the Spirit rests on and fills without measure. If you see me, I am the image of the invisible God. If you see me, then you meet my Father. 
And before we get to the Exodus ones, let's not skip over some amazing passages about Jesus in Genesis. In Genesis chapter 18, a seen Lord appears to Abraham and they talk. And that seen Lord calls down fire from heaven from the unseen Lord. Genesis 19.24 says, Then the Lord rained brimstone and fire on Sodom and Gomorrah from the Lord out of the heavens. So there there's this seen Lord who has been sent to judge sin. And Jacob sees the Lord as well. And in Genesis 32, it says, Then Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him until the break of day. Now, this man, this Lord, has got another name. Listen to Hosea 12, speaking about this experience in Genesis with Jacob. In his strength, he struggled with God. Yes, he struggled with the angel and prevailed. So this seen Lord, who's interacting with church people and leading them and teaching them lessons, also goes by the name of God and the angel. And then you have one of the best Christian statements of faith. Faith in this Lord ever in Genesis 48. Jacob blessed Joseph and said, God before whom my fathers Abraham and Isaac walked, the God who has fed me all my life long to this day, the angel who has redeemed me from all evil, may he bless my sons. The God who's been my shepherd, the angel, bless my family. See, this isn't just some academic exercise. This is about learning about how the Lord Jesus keeps his people. He's been sent to do so. There's many others I'm skipping over, but some belters are in the book of Exodus. If you read Stephen's account of the book of Exodus in Acts chapter 7, he says in verse 38, The angel was with Moses and the church in the wilderness. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 4, the Apostle Paul says Christ was the leader of his people in the desert. And in Exodus chapter 3, you see this Lord, this God, in verse 4, calling to Moses. His name is I Am, or Yahweh. If you squash Yahweh down, uh, you get the name for God, I Am. Jesus would regularly own that title for himself again in the New Testament in John chapter 8. I say to you, before Abraham was even born, I am. Jesus declaring that he's a member of the Trinity, this everlasting God. And this angel who's in this bush, this Lord, this Yahweh, is talking to Moses from the bush. And in verse 6, you see Moses has to turn away. The angel says, I am God. And Moses, it says, hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. So this angel in the bush is seen and he's God. Now, remember Jesus's words. No one has ever seen God and lived. So we're in the territory here of the seen Lord sent again with a message to liberate church from the shackles of slavery. This angel in the bush, this God, this seen Lord, is the Son of God, Jesus, as Stephen and the Apostle Paul say. Exodus chapter 19 is a fascinating account with this seen Lord. The seen Lord is already on a mountain speaking to Moses, yet he speaks about another Lord that's coming down to rest on the mountain on the third day. And of course, it's all hearkening back to the promise this angel made in Exodus 3, verse 12, that he would lead church to worship this God on the mountain. I don't know if you've ever wondered, am I going in the right direction and worshipping the living God? The dead ringer that you are on the right track is that you're following Jesus. He always leads church to his father. And then the second half of the book of Exodus is all about this unseen Lord um, hidden by a cloud, giving the law to Moses on how to live the heavenly life on earth. And in all of that, we get some great verses about this angel and who he is and what he's done. Exodus 23, 20 to 23. 
the Lord says, See, I am sending an angel ahead of you to guard you along the way and to bring you to the place I have prepared. Pay attention to him and listen to what he says. Do not rebel against him. He will not forgive your rebellion since my name is in him. If you listen carefully to what he says and do all that I say, I will be an enemy to your enemies and I will oppose those who oppose you. My angel will go ahead of you and bring you into the promised land. So here we have the unseen Lord promising that church will be safely delivered to the heavenly land because the angel will deliver them. They can trust the angel because the name of the unseen God above is in this divine angel. So it's this angel, the Son of God, who commands, who leads and protects the Israelites. The knowledge and power of Jesus gets even better and is shown even more clearly in Exodus chapter 33. Read verses 7 to 11 for yourself later, but here's a summary. Moses is in a tent face to face with the Lord and talking with him. But then read on to Exodus 33, 18, all the way to chapter 4, verse 9. Moses starts speaking to the other Lord, the unseen Lord. There's a great verse in chapter 34, verse 9, where the two lords are in the same verse. Listen to this. Lord, Moses said, if I have found favor in your eyes, then let the Lord go with us. Now, if I had time, I would also go into the glory of the third Lord, the third person of this God who is three, in Exodus 35, 30 to 31, where God the Spirit fills church members so they can help out in church and make equipment and make all these bits of um, church furniture which are going to bring glory to God. But we'll do that another time. But for now, in chapter 33, the conversation goes on and Moses wants the unseen Lord to go with him. And the unseen Lord reminds him that his presence, this is another name for the angel, son of God, my presence will go with you. And Moses considers this to be so important to the life of church. It's like, give me your presence, give me Jesus or we will die. And in Exodus 34, Moses is desperate now to get this angel Lord, this presence to go with them. In verse 9, Lord, he said, if I have found favor in your eyes, then let the Lord go with us. Give us Jesus or we die. I mean, if this isn't the Son of God, A, Jesus is a liar because people are seeing the Father. Or B, there's a rogue angel walking around planet Earth in the Old Testament claiming to be God. Now, the work of the angel to lead people to meet God the Father and experience new life does not finish there. In a moment, I'm going to paste up tens of verses of this divine angel and him leading church and interacting with people and keeping them. And people have faith in him as he guides them. Let me just pick out some of my faves of the angel of the Lord. In Numbers chapter 9, 15 to 23, there's this Lord who's instructing the church when to move and when to not move. And this presence of the Lord is so powerful in the midst of their church worship. And you might be thinking, well, which Lord is that? Well, that's a great question. And it's answered in Numbers chapter 14. In Numbers chapter 14, we learn that the surrounding nations even know which Lord is regularly among his people physically. It's the seen Lord. This is verse 13. Moses said to the Lord, then the Egyptians will hear about it by your power. You brought these people up from among them. Well, Paul, Stephen and Jude have already spelled out who's leading them. Verse 14. And they will tell the inhabitants of this land about it. They have already heard that you, Lord, are with these people and that you, Lord, have been seen face to face that your cloud stays over them and that you go before them in a pillar of cloud by day and in a pillar of fire by night. I just love that one because the fame of the Son of God is spreading across the nations. And isn't that our desire of Christians that the Lord Jesus Christ and his fame would be scattered across the world? Now, this Lord in a powerful appearing, is it really Jesus? Well, it happens again elsewhere in the Old Testament. This angel is so powerful. Solomon builds a temple for the name of the Lord and the Lord fills it exactly the same way he had filled it in the tabernacle in Exodus 40. This Lord, this member of the Trinity, appears to Solomon 
in 1 Kings chapter 9 and in Isaiah chapter 6. Well, which Lord is it? Again, it's the seen one. I mean, there's no doubt about it. If you read John chapter 12, verse 41, quoting that time, Isaiah said this, referring to Isaiah chapter 6, because he saw Jesus's glory and spoke about him. This is how the presence of the Son of God really did remain with his people all the way my Saviour leads me. I'm not going to stop on Joshua 5, but read it for yourself, because this scene, Lord, is now appearing as a warrior, and Joshua has to bow down and say, oh, I, I hope you're on my team. I'm going to chuck up on the screen now, like, loads of verses that I've promised that for you to look up about the angel of the Lord, and just learn about the ways Jesus delivers his people and protects them. Jesus always fights the battles for his church. Read him in Judges 2 verses 1 to 5 where he comes up from like his army base in Gilgal. The angel of the Lord comes up. The angel of the Lord went up from Gilgal to Bochim and said, I brought you up out of Egypt and led you to this land. There it is again, the sun leading us to the promised land. But I want to land on my all-time favourite. Read Judges 13 3 to 23 for this minister's favourite account of the angel of the Lord. The angel of the Lord is there. He wants to talk to the wife, not the husband, because wives are better than husbands. And in verses 15 to 17, Manoah, he said to the angel of the Lord, would you like to stay and eat some food? And the angel of the Lord says this, I will not eat any of your food, but if you prepare a burned offering, offer it to the Lord. Now, how many times in the Gospels do we learn about how Jesus wants all glory to go to his Father? And here it is, Manoah says, what is your name? And verse 18, the angel of the Lord replies, why do you ask my name? It is beyond understanding. It is too wonderful. And the flame blazed up from the altar towards heaven, and the angel of the Lord ascended in the flame. Verse 22, we're doomed to die. And he said to his wife, we have seen God, Jesus, too wonderful, too big to ever fully comprehend. Uh, Glenn Scrivener said this, Jesus has always been the saving ground level appearing Lord, mediating perfectly the saving plan and character of his Father. All glory to Jesus. Hey, but don't take my word for it. Read those passages yourself. And here are some heavyweights that hold the same position from church history. Here's John Calvin on the angel of the Lord. But let us inquire who this angel was, since soon afterwards he not only calls himself Jehovah, but claims the glory of the eternal and only God. The saints have never had any communication with God except through this promised mediator. It is not then to be wondered at if the eternal word of God, of one Godhead, and essence with the Father assumed the name of the angel. John Owen, speaking on Exodus chapter 3, says the angel of the covenant, the promise, the presence of God was no other but the Son of God. Here's Jonathan Edwards, not the triple jumper, the better one. This redemption was by Jesus Christ, as is evident from this, that it was wrought by him that appeared to Moses in the bush. For that was the person that sent Moses to redeem the people. But that was Christ, as is evident, because he is called the angel of the Lord. Justin Martyr, in his dialogue with Trypho, hammers home how the angel of the Lord in the Old Testament is the second person of the Trinity, the Lord Jesus Christ. Oregon has writings on this angel that's worshipped in the book of Joshua. He says Joshua recognised not only something from God, but that which is God. For who else is chief of the armies of the powers of God except the Lord Jesus Christ? That's his homilies on Joshua 5 and 6. And Irenaeus, the church father, his work on Jesus in the Old Testament is just exceptional. 
So why is all this important? Is it some academic hobby horse? No, it is to bring glory to the Lord Jesus Christ that he may save us, warm us, teach us the oracles of his Father and fill us with his Spirit. There is no other way. All glory to the angel of the Lord, King Jesus.